Welcome, Dave. Dave Howdy. Farina. Yes. It's good to have you me. here. So you are a YouTuber and you are now an author. This is your first book, right? It is my first book, yeah. <laughs> is this Wi-Fi organic? I love that title. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is hilarious. And our, you know, my, my goal today is just to chat with you a little bit about your, your, your YouTube channel and your book and just why it is that you have taken on this task of communicating science to the world in such a wonderful way. So I, I came across your YouTube channel several years ago when I was getting ready to do a series on chemistry. So, you know, for, for people who don't know, uh, I have a second channel stated clearly where I do these animations for basically for high school and middle school classrooms, but they end up being used all over the place by people. And the goal for me is to create a short lesson that gets people excited about the science that, that their teacher's about to teach them about. So I have basically, they're kind of like teaser lessons to get people all amped up. And every time I do one of those, I spend, I spend weeks, sometimes I spend months doing background, you know, catching up, relearning the things that I'm going to be teaching in those so I don't screw up at all because it's, it's actually easy to uh, mislead people on accident, by accident when you're creating a short lesson. And so, you know, I had my, my old chemistry textbook from, from uh, college and it was just very boring for me to go through. And, s and then I found your stuff on YouTube and it was amazing because you have these, these lecture style videos. It's basically like going back to college, but faster and cleaner. It's just, it's, yeah. they're wonderful, seriously. And you had an entire series on chemistry and I was just, I was binge watching that and it, w it saved me tons of time. Uh, re-familiarizing myself. So yeah, I've been supporting you on Patreon now for probably, I don't know. Quite two, a while. Yeah. Two, I was three years. to see that uh, patronage. <laughs> I was like, Hey, another cool channel. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the way it should be. Yeah, yeah. Much appreciated. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I've been following you for a long time. And then recently you started doing, so you, how many, how many major topics have you covered in your lecture series? Oh, I don't know, between 10 and 20, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I've gone through the major biological and physical sciences, um, and now I'm branching out uh, far, far beyond that as well. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty ambitious en endeavor. I'm nothing if not ambitious, but I do intend to cover essentially every academic subject, uh, uh, n even non-science, uh, you know, over the next few decades. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, I saw you just up. I, I didn't watch it yet, but I saw you just uploaded a thing on uh, like, like political history. You, uh, well, I have an American history uh, series, yeah. uh, so I, I, I did those. I actually uh, had those written uh, by by someone else uh, in like 2017, and I recorded them all in three days. But they were so long and such a pain to animate that I put them off for so long, and I just kind of did them in small batches. So I've been releasing one a month for like four years, <laughs> yeah. and now I'm finally on like Clinton and, and you know the last couple of ones. Uh, I'll yeah. be I'll be up to date with that soon. But um, that's been a long time. Uh, but then yeah, like uh, it, in terms of non-science I have somebody writing me economics I have um you know there's uh, some other stuff in the works um so definitely still science uh, centric but uh, yeah. I am starting to move into uh, other areas as well yeah I, and it's amazing how how often you're able to publish because it, some people will publish every day or multiple times a week but their stuff is crap you know your stuff mm -hmm. is so well like thought out well, i don't it, i don't understand not, how you're doing this <laughs> yeah if, if not crap i think the people that that post so frequently are usually doing sort of like um they're writing on a tablet and they're just sort of like yeah they're basically doing a live tutoring session so that's like your khan academy or your organic chemistry tutor those those kinds of people um i'm, I'm doing not quite like such elaborate animations as like a crash course or something like that. Right. It's more in the middle. Um, so they're very, very rudimentary, but I do want that kind of clean aesthetic, but yes, uh, to, I mean, to be frank, I, I, I work an absurd amount. <laughs> I yeah. work, uh, <laughs> yeah. Many, yeah, yeah. yeah, most, most of my waking hours I'm making this content. So yeah, it, it's very obvious that you are a <laughs> incredibly busy. So, and now recently too, you've, you've kind of, you started delving into debunking videos and debate videos. I saw you, you've done, I actually haven't watched your debates on flat earth, but I've, I've seen that you've been doing them. So you're, you're starting to tackle some of these, uh, yeah, expanding Those heavy hitting topics issues. like the shape of the earth. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I actually it's it's really kind of interesting because um uh, flat earth is, as a science educator flat earth is kind of interesting because it's something that really is hard to just figure out intuitively but you can actually do the sci- you can actually redo some of these old experiments i mean if if someone wanted to if, if a science teacher wanted to get really creative with this they could have their students you know try and redo this by you know you know the sticks in the shadows yeah, yeah sticks and shadows and it's yeah. uh <clears throat> Yeah, it's really interesting that uh, that this is happening, and I, you know, I I try and imagine like two hundred years into the future, if our species still exists, like technology might be so advanced that we might maybe one of the the things that we would spend our time doing is is you know the average person wouldn't be able to contribute at all to science because we're going to have computers that are doing that, right, mm-hmm. or or something. And maybe what the average person will be doing is redoing old experiments and, re, you know, for re-exploring. Fun, yeah. yeah. So this is kind Industry of like sets a... for adults, yeah. Yeah. So I, I see some of these, like, uh, these these problems that are popping up, like Flat Earth, as kind of a way to start re-exploring the things that the ancient mm-hmm. uh, thinkers already discovered. And it's kind of cool. Like, you, there's... I don't... Did you see the, the documentary on the Flat Earth movement? I did, yeah. Yeah, like in the very end, they're they, they're setting up this experiment with lasers and trying to trying to uh, measure the. Yeah, well, th- those are the guys that got me into debunking because uh, yeah. that's how it all started. Was <clears throat> I made like a really innocuous video in as part of my astronomy series that was just like, "Hey, uh, I heard that some people think the Earth is flat. Uh, no, it's not. Here's why." Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then those people specifically were the ones that jumped on it and made that live stream, three and a half hour live stream, just oh. like you know mocking me and you know just uh you know, making fun of me for 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 the whole time and i'm very vindictive so i was like mm, that's not gonna fly <laughs> so that's that's when i made the response to them which is now my most viewed video on my yeah. entire channel it's got oh, like wow. over yeah. five million views so um that's why i got into debunking it was just like to settle that grudge of <laughs> just these people that's making funny. fun of me so so yeah. and yeah, those are the guys that accidentally prove the Earth is a sphere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's but, pretty but, funny. Yeah, but, but look at how cool that is because these people are like, they're, they're trying to redo an experiment and you have you have all the confirmation bias. It, you can actually, you can watch in real time yeah. how, how confirmation bias works and mm-hmm. then how, like some of them were persuaded by that, right? Like there's there's been several flat earthers that have, fully come over and been like, okay, that was insane. Right. The party's yeah, over. I mean, <clears throat> most of the prominent ones are not, I mean, most of the prominent ones are, are, are con men, right. They're not, right. You know, most people don't actually believe it. I think, I think there is some truth to the rumor that this modern incarnation of flat earth was some kind of psyop or some kind of 4chan meme or something that was just like, what's the dumbest thing that we can possibly propagate. I know yeah. there's, fucking flat earth um but uh the problem is uh, uh, an unexpected number of people fell for it and whenever you have that kind (laughs) of uh, atmosphere you're gonna have people who take advantage of it so there are people who cobble together a pathetic living by doing these live streams every day or every week or whatever right and then they get their little super chats and then they're like okay great i don't have to like get a dumb job uh this is better than that so this is what i'll this is my identity now <laughs> like yeah and yeah, they know yeah. that the you know the main ones the mark sergeant or whatever they know the earth is flat. <laughs> like it's just yeah it's a show yeah. you know but um yeah i don't know it, it's just it's the funniest thing because it's the most indefensible hoax it's right. the only one that you can disprove for yourself by looking at objects and thinking like that's why we right, knew right. the earth was a sphere thousands of years ago before literally pretty much before science uh, everything else gets yeah, more yeah. of a pass anti-vax um you know anything else is more defensible than this one because right. it requires literally zero scientific knowledge of any kind it's just requires that you can you know think logically pretty much yeah so <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. So yeah, folks, super chats. Keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, throw a buck his way. <laughs> super chats are what's keeping the uh, the flat Earth stuff alive, and uh, it, it can keep good science channels alive too. Mm-hmm. Um, that. So when did you? I, I'm curious with, with your YouTube channel. When did you? What what caused you to start it? And then at what point did you did you decide I'm going full time with this, and I can afford mm-hmm, to go full time mm-hmm. with this? Like how how did that whole transition? Happen. <clears throat> yeah so um 
I, I'm a musician and, and I spent my twenties, uh, trying to just, I was in bands and just trying to be successful in music and, um, and, you know, it was going well. And in my late twenties, early thirties, I was in this band called the lonely wild and we were signed and touring and, you know, we we're just, it was looking really good. And so we were touring all the time and we were in the tour van and, uh, <clears throat> We figured out. We we decided, or we we all need some passive income because uh, we're on the road a lot. So we, you know, we're we're not putting money into the band. It's paying for itself, but we don't. We're not taking money home to pay rent and things. So uh, we all need passive income. And I thought, all right, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. Uh, and I had been teaching uh, organic chemistry at this trade university uh, only about a year prior. So I taught 2010 to 2013. Um, and so I taught that course many times and I got uh, good at, at lecturing that content. And, uh, this was only a year after that. So I was, I, I had all those lectures fresh in my head. I thought, all right, I'm going to deliver my OCHEM lectures to camera and I'm going to put them on YouTube and have a little branding and make a little channel and, and we'll see what happens. Maybe I'll make some money. And those were received pretty well. <clears throat> and so that's when I did the general chemistry tutorials, uh, which you were, were talking about what, that then I did, you know, green screen, a little, some basic animations. And uh, those were, were received well uh, also. And so then when the band kind of wasn't working out, as it turned out in around 2016, um, I kind of had nothing left. And, you know, I, I still I, yeah. I still wanted to and actually currently today still intend to do art and make music and have that be um, the focus of my life. But, um, <clears throat> you know, what I was left with was just I had this channel that was starting to come up. You know, I had about. I don't know, 20,000 subscribers or something like that at, at that time. Yeah. And so I started to look around. I looked on socialblade.com and, and was like, you know, uh, what are what are YouTubers making? You know, what are the big YouTubers making? And I just was completely flabbergasted by how much money there was to be made in YouTube. Yeah. So I just thought, uh, I'm going to go all, all in on this because this can lead me somewhere. And I sort of began to envision what could be like a science communication career and what could be something that could take me to to some other place where I you know would want to would want to be. Uh, and I just thought, all right, I'm going to do this 70 hours a week until <laughs> this is doing something. Yeah. And along the way, I was pleasantly surprised by what what a difference it made too. I started to receive a lot of emails and a lot of comments from people, uh, you know, thank you. This is helping me get past my classes. And, uh, and especially people in underdeveloped, underdeveloped countries were saying, wow, like I don't have access to any educational resources. So this is really uh, critical for me. So that part came along too, where I just thought, all right, look, uh, this is my best chance at being successful. And it's the place where I can make the most difference for humanity. Yeah. Like this is a no brainer. I'm going to do this until it's become something so it was kind of a five-year plan and here we are five years later and it's uh it's it's working out so <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah. awesome <clears throat> mm -hmm. that when did you know for sure that it was going to be financially viable like that you could i mean i didn't know i mean it, as to when it was becoming uh financially yeah. viable i would say well, let me put it this way october 2019 was the first month that my adsense revenue exceeded my rent and bills nice <laughs> so it took it took a long time yeah. yeah but the thing but the thing that that made it worthwhile anyway is that even as early as uh like early uh, as like early 2016 i was already having the visibility that attracted uh companies to uh, offer me contracts so like um because of the visibility of the channel, I was getting other work, doing similar yeah, yeah. stuff, making educational content. So from 2016 to honestly, still now, I, I, I'm actually uh, getting ready to do what hopefully will be my last contract next week, shooting some some oh, chemistry nice. tutorials. But um, people would see the content and I'd, and I'd get jobs that way. So back then when the channel was earning pennies, I, I was still using that content to attract other business that uh, I could pay yeah. my bills doing these contracts and doing the channel. Then as the channel got more successful, I could, I could do less and less of the contracts. Although I was still saying yes, if the, you know, if the dollar amount was, was, was right. Um, <clears throat> but the end goal is to n not only not do any contracts, but also begin to outsource most of the work for the channel and start to, you know, pull away and yeah. steer the ship and have sort of a, this self-sustaining uh, business where I don't have to be rowing the oars, uh, <laughs> Yeah. 70 hours a week so i'm yeah. very close but um yeah the, but but in short it's you don't know i mean like any other business it's a gamble and and you you have to have faith in yourself and and faith in, in what you're doing i felt very strongly that the content i was putting out was was good and was better than the other content that was out at the time i felt that i served a purpose and um it didn't hurt that i guess i really had nothing else going for myself and didn't really have any <laughs> other option i i i don't like having jobs i don't like um 
it's just, it, it was all I had. I was like, all right, this is it. This is what I've got. So this is what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so the, um, <laughs> you don't like having jobs. It's mm-hmm. funny. Cause, because I mean, you're working insane hours, but yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to work for someone else. Oh yeah. And there's a no, huge no, no. difference between that. Yeah. And... It's not the hard work part. I work harder than literally anyone I've ever met in my entire life. It's just that I don't like working for other people. I don't like people telling me what to do. Uh, I have an inability to mask my contempt for authority. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I don't like generating wealth for other people. You know what I mean? It's like, where's the, where's the incentive, any job I've ever had, you know, it's like in, in office space, you know, where he's like, yeah. look, my, my only motivation is to work just barely hard enough to not get fired. <laughs> That's yeah, how yeah. I feel when I'm in any job, but when I'm running my own business, of course, there's incentive to work harder. The harder I work, the more successful the business gets. So I work right. like a maniac. Um, and especially now knowing that, you know, this was a five-year plan. Uh, and it has taken precisely five years to get to this point where I can now maybe hopefully start to pull back and, and hire people to do certain tasks and things. But, um, you know, you got to do it. You got to put that time in if, uh, if yeah. that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. But for anyone who's, uh, <clears throat> who's wanting to learn stuff, I mean, it's like, seriously, your, your lectures, are, are what they were better than my college lectures at, I mean, wait, they were quicker. They were more to the point and mm-hmm. they were as accurate you know so it, it was it was awesome going through that and finding cool. your channel so i mean that is yeah that is why i why i support you i got a question in the chat saying do you take questions from the audience and the answer is yes <laughs> if you do at stated space casually i'll see that and then if if you had a super chat i'll obviously i'll see that even more because it's like big and bold on my screen but the um so y- you've you are taking you you are having the shift right now from these lectures to these debate style videos <clears throat> do you feel that um it, basically so there's there's kind of there's there's just teaching teaching is this sort of nurturing role right and then debunking mm-hmm. is this sort of aggressive role do you yeah. feel like it uh does it change the rest of your life at all when you get into a debunk mode does it like does it affect oh, yeah. the rest of yeah <laughs> well i mean it doesn't affect me so much personally uh you know, other than that it brings out certain aspects of my personality that maybe i wouldn't put at the front you know at the forefront of my life as much more what it does is it just uh the the attention it attracts and the volume yeah. of trolling and and combat combative people uh and misinformed people i mean that is a big shift for for four yeah. years my, I had almost zero negative comments on my channel. It was just, oh, thank you. I'm studying this, blah, blah, blah. Once a, you know, a couple times a year, there'd be like, you're a, you know, pharma shill or something, you know, whatever. And I'm like, haha, that's ridiculous. Now, I mean, hundreds of comments per day yeah. oh, of yeah, yeah. nonsense. And so, you know, you have to make that decision with yourself, how, how much you want to engage with them. And I engage way more than others do. Others completely ignore them. I figure if I'm going to get in the trenches, I'm going to get in the trenches, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, um, uh, I do not make too many friends with that behavior. I, I'm definitely uh, uh, those that I debunk and those who fall for those that I've debunked do not like me. <laughs> not one bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what are you going to do? You know, <clears throat> if I'm, if you're committed to changing the narrative and, and, uh, and uh, rehabilitating public perception of science, you're going to rub up against that and, you just got to make peace with that. So yeah, that's what I've done. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the videos on stated clearly are about evolution. And so I get, I would say at least half of my comments, I, and I'm not being competitive. I'm just, I'm just teaching yeah, no, how evolution works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, at least half of my comments from the start have been people who were just enraged. Uh, so I guess you, you started with chemistry and biochemistry, but you have an evolution series, don't you? Well, I have evolution. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, evolutionary biology content in my biology series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, did you were you seeing negative negative comments just from that? N- not much, not much. Because here's the thing: um, they were so like keyword specific. I mean, like one of them has has the the name Darwin in it, so that would attract yeah. them. But but in general, you know, they're they're very specific topics within evolutionary biology that maybe go under. You know, it's not like you know, somebody talking for an hour about why evolution is true and why creationism is wrong. You know I mean? That's going to attract them. But for a while, no, there was not really too much activity, even on those, uh, on those academic tutorials either. Uh, it wasn't until, 
you know, now at first it was flat earth, but then yes, lately I've been delving into, you know, creation, young earth creationism and, and, um, yeah. you know, a- anti-science zealots in that realm. And then other, you know, I have a bunch of flavors of pseudoscience that I, that I go after yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's become a, a little bit of a passion of mine. So. Yeah. One of the, one of the questions I'm getting in, uh, in the comments is about origin of life, which you, you've been, um, tackling a bit here. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says, I was wondering whether uh, he, so you, favor metabolism first or genetics or something like RNA first uh, with origin of life. Mm -hmm. That's a little too subtle for me to answer with any kind of confidence. I mean, uh, in, in, uh, I mean, you obviously know, and and some others know what's been going on with James Tour lately. Um, And I, 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 one, one really cool thing about it is that my understanding of the field from that first video I made about him to now where I've had to respond to his ridiculous series, I've gained a lot of knowledge, a lot more knowledge about origin of life research because I've actually been personally corresponding with some of these uh, researchers and I had to Mm -hmm. read a lot of papers to, to put together the, the response. So I definitely know a lot more now. And I'm now even uh, like, I, I was not really familiar with systems chemistry prior. So I wasn't really fully aware the degree to which selection was going on in that phase, sort of connecting uh, chemistry with, with biology, that sort of gray area in between where you have those molecular yeah. ensembles. And so uh, while I am now in a position to sort of conceive of these competing hypotheses, metabolism first, uh, you know, genome first, things like that. I'm definitely not in a position where I could like weigh one above the other. That's not really yeah, my place. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I could say, but I'm just excited to be in a place where I can read papers on those topics and like mm-hmm. kind of understand them, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Pre- pretty yeah. much get get what, what the paper's talking about and uh, <clears throat> start to see uh, how much is going on in that field that mm-hmm. even science, science-minded people aren't really aware of. So a lot of people who watched those response videos were like, wow, thank you. Like, I had no idea that origin of life research is so sophisticated and how much we've been doing in the past right. 20 years. Um, so uh, that's been fun. But yeah, unfortunately, I can't really give too much of an educated response to that question specifically. Yeah, yeah and, and, and actually it's um... – it, it kind of depends on what you, what, what, what is meant by first. If, if, uh, if you're asking what was the first thing to undergo true Darwinian evolution. So descent with modification acted upon by natural selection, then, uh, it's, it's kind of like, well, chains of RNA are really good at that. They're really good at doing that, obviously but we might need some sort of metabolic type system before we can get chains of RNA uh, in inadequate numbers to actually start something like the mm-hmm. RNA world hypothesis. So it's it kind of, to, to even answer that question, you have to know what it is that you're asking a little bit more, which, yeah, it, it takes a lot of, yeah. it, it gets I mean, messy. The yeah. shortest answer is probably that uh, that the RNA uh, RNA sequences and uh, and peptides uh, co-evolved in tandem. And some of right. the peptides probably had some kind of metabolic activity. Some of them operated on the RNA. There, you know, there's a lot of a lot of activity. But you know, you get uh, you get these little protocells, and you get uh, interviewing Lee Cronin for a lot of that stuff was really fascinating because he was talking yeah. about. Uh, pro- proto cell replication without a genome, so that that sort of stuff just shows you how you kind of just need mechanisms by which all of these polymers are forming at random, and then yeah. you need vesicle formation, and then you need replication um, or, or proto cell replication, and then you just in a in a rough way have this situation where you just you have nature rolling dice trillions and quadrillions of times, yeah. and then interesting uh, interesting ensembles occurring, and then something self-propagating in a statistically uh, significant way so that's my yeah. my slightly more educated than before but still not fully comprehensive of the entire field uh, <laughs> take on it you know what i mean yeah so um so uh, final question about your youtube channel what what types of videos are getting you the most attention like what what is the stickiest are people liking are, are people coming like new people coming to your lecture series or are the most new people coming to watch you fight with somebody? <laughs> oh, it's, it's definitely both. I mean, <clears throat> yeah. still, 
the uh, uh, although uh, a lot of the debunks get a lot of attention, the, the the viewership is still dramatically outweighed by my academic tutorials. Yeah. I mean, simply because there are so m so many more. Right? I have over yeah. a thousand videos on the channel, uh, only about twenty of which are are debunks. Yeah. So um, obviously the yeah the, I mean there's a lot of people who don't even know I do the debunks because they just come for their calculus tutorials or you know whatever they're learning and they right. have no idea what that I'm getting into the muck with this other stuff. Um, but definitely, I mean, I, I, I'm actually pretty shocked. I actually just went through a recent uptick with the Flat Earth stuff um, because YouTube started um, putting one on the on the YouTube homepage for a bunch of people. I, I don't know exactly yeah. what happened, but YouTube started pushing one of my Flat Earth debunks like crazy. Uh, hmm. And so I just got this huge spike for all, all of my Flat Earth debunks, which is there's like seven or eight of them. And uh, yeah. I was just like, wow. I mean, <laughs> was, I mean I'll mean, i take it. I'll take it. But it's like, you know, I have other content that's more interesting than this. But right. um, people find it very amusing, I guess. But, um, yeah, so so I don't know. P people love the Flat Earth debunks. Um, I think they just like how salty I get and how very clearly um, fed up I am <laughs> with yeah, this yeah, particular yeah. brand of stupidity. So it's more entertainment for rational people, I think, yeah. than anything else. But, well, and then um, people are like, "That's my teacher," <laughs> right? For oh, like me, oh, inter, like, like, oh, it's weird to see Dave who taught yeah, me about yeah. chemistry or whatever do you know ranting on flat earth. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so some people are very amused by the the two different sides of me, I suppose. Yeah. Right. Right. So okay. So so now I want to talk about your book. And okay. so, <laughs> is this Wi-Fi organic? Is the name of your book? Uh, wait, wait. What's the subtitle? I don't. I don't have a pull up. Uh, a guide to spotting misleading science online. Yeah. So, so this book, I actually, I just finished it probably three days ago. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I got the audio book and I got the, uh, the digital version. Um, I find, I find I usually need to like hear and then also read to recap some parts. So I'm, I, I've been, how's my voice sound? Oh, well, it's great. It's like, oh, this okay. is like when I'm watching, this is like when I'm watching this video. And I was really exactly. glad that you actually read your own book, which... They didn't want me to. The publisher was like, hey, so we got a great voice actor, did you blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm doing it, right? I, I assumed I was doing it. Why would I yeah. not do it? And they're like, well, that's typically not how it's done. I'm like, no, I'm, I don't care. I'm <laughs> reading my, this is ridiculous. Like, and then yeah. I had to submit it. I had to submit an audio sample to, to the people doing the audio book. And they're like, okay, fine, he can do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, typically authors don't do it, but I was like, this is not acceptable. This is like, it's me being like a little bit sassy. Like, it's not going to make any sense if someone else oh, yeah. is reading this. Yeah. So, <clears throat> no, I, yeah, I really liked the fact that you were, you were the person reading it. Plus, you I know, told him that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and your viewers, I think, yeah, because I think uh, most of the people who are going to buy your book, oh, do you think that most of your audience is, is new for the book or most of your audience is your audience going and buying your book? Um, I mean, at first, mainly my audience, uh, just cause you know, it's not like I'm selling these things like hotcakes. Like <laughs> it's not, yeah. they're not, I'm not, uh, you know, pushing the New York times bestseller list or anything. Um, definitely so far it's been mostly people, well, uh, either people who are already subscribed or, <clears throat> uh, some of my more recent debunks, I've plugged the book at the end of the debunk. So if you found my channel through my anti, anti vaccine, uh, debunk or my quantum mysticism debunk. And then you saw that plug at the end. You thought, oh, this video was really thorough. Um, maybe I'll check out this book. Right. So some people kind of newly to the channel, but then through the channel, finding you know, you get in the book. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Ho hopefully it's something that that I can, you know, sell more and more. Kind of like my videos. Like a lot of my videos I'll, I'll publish. I'll get a couple thousand views right away and then nobody cares. And then randomly yeah, later, yeah. there's a huge uh, spike later. <laughs> so hopefully yeah. I'll sell a lot later on but um yeah, i'm not quite yet of the stature where yeah. you know i'm not um as prominent a science communicator as like you know neil degrasse tyson or something he'll sell a ton of books of course so right well, well I'll, i want to try and give my elevator pitch sure <laughs> well, well we'll we'll see what we'll see what's that what, what you would add here so mm -hmm. th this book it teaches people how to use the principles that have been developed through science so that the tools that scientists use when they're doing their actual science just to use those and unleash those on any claim that you might hear, either from a marketing company or like some thing that your aunt posted online um, that's scary about a vaccine or whatever. This helps you just apply these these mental techniques, the the the, 
the critical thinking skills, and that that term, by the way, critical thinking has now been corrupted heavily by the anti-science <laughs> movement. So we're actually going to talk about that later. But it helps you use these these scientific critical thinking skills to just probe the claim that's being made and figure out if it's if it's legitimate or not. And you also splice in a bunch of little lessons about chemistry and physics and biology, and it's just a, it's just beautiful how it all came together. Thank you. Yeah, I, it is about the the mental techniques and stuff like that, but but it is also very much about just the rudimentary knowledge because let's face it, you, if you don't know the very basics about what molecules are and how they behave and what cells are, and you know mm -hmm. the uh, I do have to throw in those very very basic uh, lessons on chemistry, biochemistry, biology, physics, because without it, you there's you have no hope. You have no hope yeah. of comprehending these topics. So. Uh, in in a similar vein of my channel, I try to ultra condense it. So you know, what are the most important things you need from high school chemistry in yeah. 15 pages? You know what I mean? Something like that. So um, <clears throat> it's a shortcut. You know what I mean? Here's this. Just you got to know this. So you you will right. not understand. You know, uh, from from the very beginning, just taking like you know, I think uh, when people see uh, you know organic chemistry line notation and they see the hexagons and the lines and the you know and they just right. go ah what is that? You know, I can't possibly understand. Well, yes, you could. I, I can I can get you there in 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 half a chapter. You know, if you just give me that time, I can get you to be able to know what that structure is is representing. Uh, and you have to because other you know uh, the unfamiliarity with that kind of symbology is part of what leads to chemophobia. You know, right. we, we fear what we don't understand, and so let me help you get to a place of rudimentary understanding so that you won't fear this anymore yeah That's chemophobia the... being the fear of things with chemicals in them right <laughs> yeah chemical yeah. sounding chemicals and chemical sounding things uh with the irony being that such people don't realize that literally everything we can see is chemicals <laughs> right right so right. and uh, i mean just the title is this wi-fi organic really kind of like i mean obviously it's it's exaggerating what people actually think about organic and so on but it's just it's just it, that was really funny I, I just, mm -hmm. it, great great title I stole it from uh, Bobby Moynihan. <laughs> yeah. uh, d it's his uh, drunk uncle um, SNL character. So what had yeah. happened was I, I was brainstorming titles uh, for, for the book. And so I did a big brain dump, you know, bunch of keywords, bunch of possible titles. And then I picked my favorite dozen or so and I gave them to the publisher and they said, oh, this is funny. Is this wife organic? That's funny. And then I thought about it. I was like, wait a minute, where did I, I didn't come up with that. And then I it hit me. I was like, oh, no, I stole it from that because <laughs> he has this great character. Um, but then I told them where it's from and they're like, oh, it's fine. It's going to be totally fine. But I was like, we have to use this because it's just too perfect. It's it yeah. absolutely embodies that. Uh, it, it's it, it's a playful jab at the target demographic of the book. You know right. what I mean? Right. So yeah, I had to use. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so I so a lot of the a lot of the science was was overview for me, except for some of the physics. It, because I physics hasn't been really my my thing. It's you know I learned some physics in college, but that was a while ago. Mm -hmm. For people who are like really new to chemistry and cellular biology, I definitely recommend getting uh, like getting a a form of the books you can read because like I, I I was perfectly fine listening to everything except for the physics part. That's when I was like I I'm gonna buy the book so the 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 written copy so that I can actually. Yeah. Get the um, diagrams. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Get the diagrams, and then like stop and go back and and read read through some parts. So I would recommend for anyone who's yeah not super familiar with chemistry and biology to get the book so that, so that you can see all the diagrams and everything. But yeah, this this was just great. I mean, it, it, it's really simple. The 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 way you've done it, you stated it very clearly. So <laughs> you've <laughs> simplified things as much as possible without yeah. ruining them, and. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of the physics stuff, you're, you're talking about energy and um, yeah, that was the stuff that was, I was like, yeah, I, re I do remember learning about all this stuff, but trying to, yeah, trying to keep this in my head. Yeah. I, I needed to go back and, and be able to, to go slower through that section. So yeah. Yeah. The really idea cool. is to, to define these words that are used improperly in society. Yeah. Energy is one of the main ones or energy is one of yeah. the most misused words in the English language. So uh, yeah, the whole chapter 
is energy defined. <laughs> let's get this right. Yeah. Let's talk about what energy means so that we can disarm the narratives of all these people who speak about energy as though it's a mystical entity. You know, yeah. so that's my my yeah. quantum mysticism debunk is is the same on my channel. It's actually taken largely from portions I wrote for the book and just sort of uh, yeah. It, it's a yeah. Now I'm sort of taking stuff from the book and making videos based on that to sort of uh, you know. Uh, capitalize on <laughs> the yeah. work I did for the book and make videos with it too. So, yeah, I mean, it, having different definitions for the word energy is fine. It's, it's it's when people confuse them and mix them. So you're using, I mean, so you talked about how people use a metaphorical version of the word energy and mix that with the scientific yeah. definition, and that's what causes the confusion. Yes. I don't even know which came first, like. The mystical versions of energy or the scientific versions of energy i don't know i don't know the history of that word it's a good question i'm not sure either uh, I, I think it's impossible to answer if if we if we if we uh take into account translation right i'm sure that yeah, you know yeah. the ancient greeks probably had some word that we would maybe think of as being translated to energy but they were probably using it in a mystical way themselves you know natural philosophy was science and religion in one so right Right. But that's because they did not understand these physical phenomena. How could they, you know, at that time? Yeah. But uh, so it's hard to say. All I know <laughs> is that, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's precisely that the literalization of a metaphorical usage for a word like energy is what creates a confusion. Uh, and then there are these people who, who exploit that confusion and, you know, yeah. use energy deliberately to mislead uh, people in that mystical way to sell seminars and and healing techniques and uh, yeah. things of that nature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we so we have the y y your book really tells people how to how to just think through these these issues. Uh, one of the one of the really neat things in your book was the section on how science is funded, mainly like things like medicine. So big pharma, which has this. When you say big pharma, that's like, it makes people cringe. Like, oh, yeah. it's they're they're doing mm -hmm. all these horrible things, and uh, there's a bunch of reasons they have a bad reputation. Uh, so, uh, my wife is a nurse. My brother-in-law is a doctor. So we talk about this a lot. Like people who don't who don't want to trust medicine, and one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons that we found that I don't, I don't think it's really mentioned in the book. It's just that um, the medical industry has meticulous record keeping it's also huge so because actual like mainstream medicine is you know they're they're the ones you go to when you're injured there's going to be accidents inevitably and so those things get remembered and then when there's a really small like naturopathic or like a homeopathic group that's doing something and they kill somebody it's not it doesn't. It doesn't take hold on the alternative medicine group in general. It's mm -hmm, they're mm -hmm. they're not even a they're not even a a structured group. So nothing can be pinned on them. Whereas every 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 mishap in medicine is pinned on Western medicine, right? So right, there's, right. there's 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 that um there's there's that thing that's happening. Also, we have um just the fact that uh, an actual doctor will tell you. Uh, we don't have a way to treat this disease, whereas mm -hmm. an alternative medicine person might say, "Oh, I can help you with this, Take whether or not they can." Yeah. Right. So, so what happens is, is you can go to the doctor, and you, you you do talk about this in your book. You go to the doctor, and they can't help you, and you're desperate, and you want something, and so you go to alternative medicine, and they're they're willing to take you in and treat you, and make you feel like you're being treated, no matter what. It, it doesn't matter. So. There's there's a lot of reasons that people start to hate big pharma and modern medicine. And then one of the one of the big reasons that people are discussing with big pharma is all the all, all the things that we see with the money. They're charging this much for this medication and they have this patent on this and and mm -hmm. uh at the in the very start of your book, the way you had talked about it, I thought that maybe you would actually be attacking that more and i was like huh i'm, I'm curious how how he's going to go into this and then in the actual section on on big pharma you you had just this brilliant explanation or just dissection of how this is all funded and why things work the way that it does and i was just yeah. wondering if you could expand on that a little bit here because i thought that was really really brilliant yeah. 
I mean, all, all those, I mean, there are some ways that you can criticize big pharma. You know, you can talk about how they bribe doctors and stuff like that. You know, they, like any other huge industry, there, there, there are unethical things that can happen. But most of the major talking points that are against big pharma are, are completely misled. So, you know, yeah. price points, uh, you know, profit margins, that the profit margins are higher, you know, generally, what, 15% or, you know, 20%. Um, uh, and, and the thing about patents, I mean, all, all of this is completely invalid criticism, right? Yeah. The, there is no other industry that takes on such immense financial risk as pharmaceuticals, because yeah. you can spend a billion dollars on a target and end up empty handed, but there's, there's no other in industry that does that. If you make a, a, a luxury chair, I say in the book, and you're not selling it for this really high price point that you hoped because you spent all this money on advertising and thought, oh, I'm going to make everybody think this is the best chair ever and they're going to pay all this money and then they don't. All right, well, cut it in half, cut the price in half. Now you'll move some some products and you'll, you'll right. recoup at least a partial investment. Drugs don't work like that, right? If you, if you, there are so many, uh, uh, pr there are so many points along the process of drug development and, and drug production where yeah. it can just blow up in your face. Uh, either you went for the wrong target, right? You, 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 you identified a target and you did all the work to develop the drug. And then you found out that it's actually not addressing the, the, you know, what's going on biologically. Um, you can get problems, you know, you develop the synthesis and then when you try to scale up to an industrial amounts, you run into some kind of problem or it's just, you can waste so much money and only one in 10 drugs or one in 20, or I forget the exact uh, statistic, make it to market. So they have all this money to earn back. Uh, and uh, so that's why the profit margins are the way they are. And then the same thing with the patents, you, you need to be able to patent uh, this kind of work uh, because you know it, it would magnify the risk a hundredfold if you could put all of this work into development and then somebody else just kind of snatches your your intellectual labor uh, yeah. right from under you and, and beats you to the market with your own drug. I mean, you, you, this stuff needs to be patented. So, mm -hmm. um, but in general, people don't. Uh, I, so I do spend a lot of time talking about that and dissecting how how drug discovery and how drug development works. But beyond, beyond that, I also need to talk a lot about just like what a drug is and what a molecule is and how we synthesize molecules because people have this conception of, of Dr. Frankenstein tinkering in his lab, making a, an imitation of nature, which is just which is just ridiculous, right? You know, nature right. makes molecules, we make molecules. So I think there's a, a, a lot of um, a lot of trepidation around things like the word synthetic or the act of chemical synthesis. That uh, this is where we get the the scary man in the white lab coat uh, trope, and right. um, th that need that that is very easy to diffuse, and that's what I want to take a lot of work uh, towards diffusing. It's not that we can't uh, criticize industries and we should criticize right. industries but it's that it's when that anti-establishment uh, bias renders people incapable of separating science from industry right you, all of these things you know f if a pharma company bribes some doctors to get a medication on, on some some off-brand indication right that's no yeah. good we should talk about it or right. if uh, you know the the health insurance industry let's talk about it or if a hospital is doing something weird let's talk about it but none of that has anything to do with what a drug is why it works physiologically right, right? that is science and that is these are two separate realms. And so I, I want to try to encourage people to be able to make that division and have these two separate conversations. One is science. Yeah. One is sociology or, you know, uh, whatever you whatever you want to call that other half. But it's yeah. not science. So, yeah, I mean, think things are obviously they're linked because you have I mean, the way that this research is funded. Um, I mean, well, you've got you've got publicly funded research. So stuff that happens at universities a lot of times. And then you have. You have, mm. yeah, people investing money in a drug that might potentially work. Yeah. And there are problems with both of those. You talk a little bit about the Russian, the older Russian system where everything mm. was funded by the government and they just didn't have innovation uh, or much innovation. They, they had innovation, but not, not nearly as much as mm -hmm. when you have the, this competitive atmosphere. And this competitive atmosphere, it's, it's really good at generating new, um, new treatments, but it also has a bunch of flaws and we don't have to ignore those flaws. Yep. We should just talk about those flaws, deal with those flaws, and exactly. also understand how wonderful this system is in spite of those flaws. Um, which, yeah, I, I absolutely yep. love that because – Let's keep capitalism. Yeah. Let's just keep it under reins, right? We right. don't want predatory right. capitalism, 
but ca- I'm good with capitalism. We can we can keep capitalism. <laughs> right. Uh, we, right. Know, we do want you know all, all of this uh, advancement happening in the private sector. That's fine. That's good. Right. You, you want to be motivated. Somebody wants to be motivated to make a fortune by generating you know creating these incredible drugs or whatever the product is. You know. Um, that's great. Let's do that. But um, then we just need to figure yeah. out how to keep everything under reins. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I really appreciated that. Like it's, it's okay for people to be angry at something crazy that happens in the industry. Sure. We, we just had this, we just had this big thing with, um, with painkillers where, uh, you know, we had a huge lawsuit, right. That, mm-hmm. that um, it, there, there are definitely are issues. Uh, you know, one of the, I had a guy on here a while ago talking about uh, it, what he does is he actually looks at uh, at folk medicine to see if there's mm-hmm. any real molecules in there or any real things that are happening. Mm-hmm. And um, he, so he spent his career actually just doing this. And he's found, he's actually found that they're extracting molecules from tobacco and from marijuana is actually the things that he's actually found that became something. Uh, so there's a, there's a molecule in tobacco that helps with Tourette's syndrome. <laughs> um, mm. they're still doing, they're still doing, um, experiments on that to see if, um, if they can actually use it as a medicine. But this was, this is, it was folk medicine. So people are smoking cigarettes all the time. We're like, Oh, this, this helps me with my Tourette's. And he's like, I'm going to take this seriously and look into this and figure out what's happening. It's really interesting that this, mm-hmm. this, uh, this style of, of finding new, new drugs, but he, um, he's had, he had a, a medication for Alzheimer's that it actually extends and all of their research, the efficacy research, it, it's safe and it works. It'll extend your brain for about three years, the, the use of your brain for about three years. So it's definitely not a cure. It's, mm-hmm. it's only, it's a band aid. but they, they didn't, the molecule is so common and so easy to produce and he screwed up with his patent. And so he, he ended up getting it patented before he started some of the major research on it. And the patent was going to run out. He screwed up on the business side of it and made the, the entire drug not financially viable. And he couldn't Mm -hmm, get, mm -hmm. he couldn't get funders excited about it. And so we really do have situations where things that could be useful just don't get funding. And you mentioned in your book, you talk about the, uh, the issue with, Anything that's not going to have a huge market might not get funded because it's just so expensive right. to do this research. So there, there definitely are flaws with this, but it's it's the best. It's you know, it's horrible and the best thing that we have. So <laughs> the uh, yeah, yeah, and I mean uh, you know we, the, what you're saying about uh, uh, getting getting uh, inspiration from nature that's nothing new, right? I mean right. Or, or herbalism yeah. and uh, but uh, yeah, all these are earliest targets morphine, psilocin, um, yeah. we got them from plants so we, right. uh, plants and initially sh- showed us what drugs are uh but it, it, it i like to highlight that whole demystification process of from a mm-hmm. sacred plant to uh, a sacred compound to then synthesizing right. our, our it ourselves and here you go it's just a molecule guys um right. so once you understand that process you understand you know w- uh, what a drug is and what it does then it, it makes you uh, a little it makes it a little easier to have this kind of conversation that that you're that you're talking about now in terms of what a patent is and why you would get a patent and, and um, what, uh, you know, everything that's on that, on the business side and mm-hmm. how it is just, it, it is a completely separate uh, conversation from whatever that drug, whatever that compound is in tobacco, that's doing what you're talking about. It's a molecule. We can okay. use it has a physiological effect. This is all a scientific discussion. And then, you know, profit margins and, and patents and things like that's completely separate discussion. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Right. Right. And, 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 and what, what you're trying to do also when you're, when you're manufacturing a drug from a plant is you're trying to get the, the positive effects with the fewest possible side effects. So with tobacco, mm-hmm. obviously, there's addiction issues and all sorts of other things that come with tobacco. So if you can actually pull the molecule out that's, that's helping with Tourette's, and if that has less side effects, that's going to be better than smoking a cigarette every sure. time you're having some ticks, right? Of course. So uh, the... Yeah, taking uh, quinine is better than chewing on cinchona bark. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right, exactly. Uh, and, and one of the things that he told me, he, he said, he said, if something doesn't have side effects, it probably doesn't have real effects. So if yeah. if if someone's trying to sell you an alternative medicine, because because he's actually, um, yeah. So I've spent a lot of time in Ecuador, 
and down there you'll you'll meet people that like our bus driver one time um someone was sick and he was um he was pulling plants out of the out of the woods and giving them to them to to eat and this guy his is obsessed with with plants and what which plants can do what but he in order to be effective at giving getting medicine from a plant you have to know you have to know what what plants can do what and if they're ready that because a plant's going to have very different amounts of the chemical in it from one individual plant to another it's going to have very different amounts of whatever the chemical is so like it was super dangerous what he's doing because he's like okay if, if you take too much of this it'll give you a heart attack <laughs> if you take yeah. the right amount it'll it'll cure um your stomach ache do you want to take that risk <laughs> you know yeah. so i and and in, in, in medicine yeah, we can we can just, take this, this yeah yeah, we take these molecules and we we have an actual dose. We test it on people. We we know what it can do and what it can't do. It's um, right. It's much more methodical, but it, it it can compete with the with the romance of of herbalism for a lot of people. You know, th- but this right. is what's funny is, you know, obviously we've known about uh, compounds with with medicinal properties for thousands of years, but it's all trial and error. It's just a bunch of people like, oh, eat that. What happened? Oh, it killed you. Okay. Don't eat that. Uh, eat <laughs> yeah. this. What, oh, you had a stomachache. Yeah. It's a little better. Okay, well, write that down. It's just this blind trial right. and error that um, you know. I, it, it's like I get the I get how, how it's like rooted in history and the the, the romanticism of it, but um, you know people need to try to understand that there's a compound in there. It's an active ingredient. We can extract it. Not right. only can we ex- extract it, we can characterize it find out the structure, synthesize it ourselves and never have to deal with it. You know, uh, furthermore, we can come up with completely novel structures for drugs that have never existed in nature before. Um, it's just more, you know, go, going back to what you're saying about side effects and people who talk about side effects, it's like if you understand uh, human physiology a little bit and enough to understand that what a drug does is you're consuming it and then it's interacting with proteins in your body, where the, whether they be enzymes or receptors or whatever, um, it is almost inconceivable that uh, a, a drug or any compound could have a singular physiological effect there's right. all kinds of nooks and crannies in all these molecules and if you if you if you make if you uh tailor your target if you tailor your compound for that target really really well it's going to mainly do that thing but right. how could it not uh in some small way slightly activate some other some other uh some other molecule um and so you're right what you said you know if if it doesn't uh have any side effects it doesn't have any effects at all right right and that's what home that's what home, homeopathy is i mean it's 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 water or sugar cube or whatever it is it is not doing anything it's a placebo effect that's what's what you're feeling so um right. yeah my my f my my passion is just trying to help people get to that very rudimentary understanding of what a drug is what it does why it does what it does etc so that they can have a more educated stance when it comes to talking about these topics and so that they don't fall for anybody that's wielding around you know when you have an anti-establishment narrative you're really easy to trick because yeah, anybody yeah. that anybody that caters to it and says look at what big pharma did well, I'm not that, and I have this other little mom and pop product to sell. Well, you're selling a product, <laughs> and yeah. it's just yeah. people are, are easy to trick in that regard. Um, and I would like to help them get to a more uh, educated uh, position. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I want to kind of uh, cap off our discussion about the book by trying to apply some of the principles that it teaches to an actual question that I got. I got this last week in the, in the comments. Uh, someone was asking me, they're, they're worried that the vaccine, the, the Pfizer vaccine is transmissible. So if you get the vaccine, then it starts to admit things out of your body that can infect other people. And I've, I looked into this cause actually my, I had some family members sending me this as well. And then I added someone commenting on, on uh, YouTube asking this. And so I actually looked into, I, I went pretty deep into the origin of this and everything. But so there is a growing number of people who believe that Pfizer is, has started, has used their name brand to initiate a sterilization program where the vaccine is a secret undercover sterilization molecule. 
And once you get injected with the, uh, the vaccine, it will start to transmit versions of it to everyone around you and make everyone else sterile as well. So how would you tackle this? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, where to even begin uh, <laughs> with the absurdity of sterility as a transmissible factor? Um, uh, yeah. may, maybe to come at it from a non-scientific perspective, um, I would like to I would like to understand why anyone thinks that sterilization would be in the interest of any of of, of anybody, uh, let alone a, a a corporation. Um, why would companies want to make there be fewer people to buy their products? Right. I'm not right. really sure what the motivation would be for anyone to want to sterilize anybody. I mean, uh, if you want to go off the deep end with conspiracies. Um, and companies wanting to control everything, uh, they want more people to control and more people to make money off of. So even if you're going to entertain that sort of narrative, um, it's the precise reversal of how you would want to go about that. Um, <clears throat> but then to go to uh, so um, well, okay. Uh, so so uh, well, uh, let's tease the motive a little bit. Let's let me play devil's advocate because okay. we definitely have had sterilization programs in the past. We had the whole mm -hmm. eugenics movement in the in the U.S. We had it in Germany and so on in Europe. So sterilization is a thing. That's there are there are groups that want less people, but you have Pfizer who has spent millions of dollars on their brand, probably billions of dollars on their brand, right? Mm -hmm. And they made this vaccine, and they tell us what's in it. They've got approval from the FDA. Maybe you could say, maybe you could say that there's some oh, the secret FDA's group. Corrupt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, yeah, I guess you could say that. But, but still, even if the FDA is corrupt and the FDA secretly wants to sterilize the world, Pfizer's not going to be like, okay, yeah, use my name brand I'll to do it. it. That's yeah, great. Exactly. But I mean, what uh, you're saying, um, you know, obviously eugenics is a thing that has existed, um, but um, th this is indiscriminate usage. I mean, there's no like, uh, there's no population that's being targeted. <laughs> right, uh, right. And in fact, white people are more likely to get the vaccine than, than you know, uh, other groups, I think, probably. I, I, it seems like a statistic that came from somewhere. Maybe I'm not sure. Maybe that's not true. But um, well, I, yeah, well, I think just... I think, yeah, well, Americans are going to be first to get the vaccine. So. If, and in classic eugenics terms, that would be it, things have been flipped because, like in yeah, it, eugenics was horrible, but what what it was doing is it was trying to give the people with power more power, and mm -hmm. uh, in the case of this vaccine, the groups that have more power are getting first access to the vaccine, you know, nations that are right. more powerful. So it it would be it would be un. It, it's the it's, reversal of the, it's yeah it's not it's not yeah. the same as what was happening in eugenics before but just no, you, that's ethnic cleansing yeah yeah but um yeah so, so there's that side but 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 then to get to this transmissibility thing i mean i i think that it's just that people i mean they're they're confusing the concept of 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 what a virus is uh with what a vaccine or is or at least what this particular vaccine is uh i mean i thought that everybody was aware that there is no viral particle in these COVID vaccines. So there, yeah, there's nothing yeah. to transmit, uh, you know? Yeah. But. Yeah. So, so in order for, in order for something to transmit from one person to another, cause we do have these vaccines, we use them in, in wild animal populations, uh, where you, you'll take a virus, an actual virus, and you'll inject a gene into that virus. And, and the virus is still alive. The virus can actually infect, um, individuals, you'll inject a gene into that virus that you want that will make the animal also immune to something that can kill it, something that's killing that population. And we've only done this experimentally, by the way. We haven't actually done this. Uh, it's been it's been an, it's an experimental vaccine method for endangered species. We've done experiments on them with rabbits. So there's these there are the different islands in the I think in, in the Pacific that have huge rabbit populations, and so we use them to test out these different methods. But there is a there is a vaccine that makes rabbits immune to a disease that kills them, and they use a virus that's not deadly, and they inject one gene from the deadly virus. So it it, it is kind of like like a normal vaccine where you you inject something from the deadly version that the immune system can then recognize. Mm -hmm. So it's a retrovirus. You're in uh, no, it's not. the gene into the genome. Or 
this is not a, it's, I don't think this was a retrovirus, uh, but it, the virus is going to replicate inside the rabbit's body. The rabbit's going to get sick and transmit that virus to other rabbits. And it's got in it uh, one of the molecules from the actual deadly virus, mm -hmm. right? So that they will, they will become immune to this virus that we, is now spreading among them, and they'll get immune to the deadly virus at the same time. Whatever's going on, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, so we've done this and, you know, you had a population of several hundred, hundred rabbits. They vaccinated like 10 of them, then they let them go. And they found that 70% of the rabbits in the population after a couple of months were immune to the deadly virus. So mm -hmm. this is something that exists. And this is something, a lot of times you'll find this with, with these conspiracies. They'll, they'll find something that exists and they'll try and connect the dots. Like, Distort it. Yeah. Right. And uh, so... Transmissible vaccines are a thing. They are experimented on in animals for use on animals. We we don't want to use them in humans because they actually the it's not clear how safe it is, right? Some of these rabbits are probably going to die from the infection of this uh, virus itself. So you wouldn't want to use this on humans because you actually care about each individual. With a with a wildlife population, you care about the species or the the population that you're trying to preserve. With humans, mm -hmm. you care about individuals. So. It's way too dangerous for us to be using on people. It's, it's never been even close to being approved for use on people. Then if Pfizer was doing this, they would be lying to us. You have labs all around the world that can look at what's in a virus, and people do this all the time. Like my, uh, uh, One of my neighbors was, did mass, mass spec for a living, and uh, she, was, she was French, so she's like super addicted, addicted to cigarettes. And she came mm -hmm. here, no, nobody likes it when you smoke anywhere. Uh, and uh, in Oregon is where we, we lived. So she had to go to e-cigarettes and uh, she was like taking all the different e-cigarette solutions and putting them through mass spec to see what they're made of to, to try and figure out if, uh, if they're accurate on the mm -hmm. labels and which one mm -hmm. might be the best for her to be taking. So people who have access to labs, they do stuff like this all the time. If, if Pfizer had something in there that wasn't what they said it was, someone would have figured it out. Like this is not... Uh, yeah. It's 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 not hard to do if you have the tools. Yeah, billions and, of these doses going around. You know, right? It's, right. It's not, yeah, we're not all just like, huh? But um, yeah, I mean, there's no. Uh, but most importantly, there's there's yeah, there's nothing transmissible in there. I mean, I, right? I guess it's it's too much for to expect everybody to know what mRNA is. But that's why you have all these science yeah. communicators put putting up all these videos like, hey, here's what mRNA is, and you know, trying to uh, explain the basics of transcription and translation. But um, yeah, there's no, there's no vir there's no virion. There's not even a envelope protein. There's, there's no viral particle of of any kind. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's pretty easy to squash that one. There is physically no way that this virus could transmit from one person to another. And one of the one of the things that oh, yeah, 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 this mm -hmm. vaccine. The one of the things. So I I ended up tracing this back to Alex Jones' website, <laughs> and that that's where this whole thing Shocker. was spreading from. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that's where it originated, but he, uh, he picked up on it and, and he has a big, pretty big uh, megaphone there. So what he did is he looked at, there was a, there was a file it, for use by people who are administrating the vaccine. It says that if you have contact with, um, with the, I can't remember what the word was. I should probably have written this down before talking about it online, but, um, with with the 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 test unit, if if you have physical contact with the test unit or if you inhale it, you should report that because it might have effects on you. And how they had interpreted this is saying that if you in if you touch the person who got the vaccine or inhale their breath, then you need to alert authorities because you might be infected. So they they just completely distorted this document to make it got look it. like the individual can transmit it. When they were actually talking about if you if you inhale the actual vaccine itself, like the actual liquid, or like get it on your skin, that has not been tested. We don't know what 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 could happen there. Yeah. So, inform um, Pfizer that this has happened. So, it was just that's that's the problem with with misinformation is just that you, you it's so easy to like make up something like that, like take one thing, yeah. distort it, turn it into this other thing, and then let it loose. 
and confuse a bunch of people. Whereas correcting that requires this detective work that you're describing, right. where you have to sort through this mountain of nonsense, find this person is saying this, they got it from here. What this came from is they misinterpreted or deliberately lied about this original thing. Like it's just so right. much work to expose the origin of the misinformation a hundred times harder than to just make something up and trick people. So it's just, right, right. That's the uphill battle. That's why we need an army of science communicators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's me. Yeah. And, and the other problem too, is that the, the debunking is never as sexy as the, the, uh, the scare, right? Like, right. It's terrifying. So, you know, there's a bunch of people on Twitter reporting that they're having um you know like i'm a nurse i give vaccines and i had a miscarriage and so they're linking it to this and then other people are saying oh i had my you know my period is off or whatever like these are things that happen all the time but also like w with miscarriages yeah i think it's like one in eight known pregnancies ends in miscarriage but it's taboo to talk about you don't talk about it usually when you have a miscarriage mm -hmm. so the general public doesn't know how common miscarriages are so yep. when when people suddenly start talking about miscarriages, it sounds like oh my gosh, correlation is causation, right? Yeah, and same so with people, autism. People get scared. Yeah, we had this with the autism vaccine mm -hmm. scare, right? So it's uh, it's totally understandable that this happens. Um, it's it's going to happen naturally, and then you have financial incentives to poke it and expand it. Uh, you know, people like you know that are actually getting money to spread conspiracies. <laughs> Because they get ad yeah. revenue through YouTube videos or whatever, uh, yeah, and they get a little uh, a little celebrity status too, which is right. a driving factor. Yeah, right. So it just it, it makes sense that this is spreading, but it, yeah, it's so hard, <laughs> so hard to combat. And what you've done with this book is you're giving people the base understanding that they need to know to to really immediately understand. Oh, that claims BS. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously that's not true. Because ninety percent um, of it is like that. Ninety yeah. percent of it. I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in any academic field. I know a pretty good I know a lot about chemistry and a decent amount about other stuff, but some of these things that are out there that people are talking about are just so at face value ridiculous. It's so easy to dismiss if you have some science competency. Then yeah. there's always that last 10% where, all right, all right so we got to dig a little deeper. We got to talk to some experts. I don't know what to do. But just if we can get rid of that 90% of fluff, this just clearly, yeah. this clear charlatanry, uh, we'll be in a much better place. So yeah, 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 I agree. There was a line in your book. Oh, did I put it in here? It was uh, it was like genetic engineering is happening, so get over it and learn how it learn works. Learn about it now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, learn about it now. Um, I I really appreciated that just just that line too. Like we need to understand at least the basics of all of these things, and it is there is a problem with scientific progress in that uh, the more advanced we get, the more things that we have to know about and and be it be the average person has to understand so that we don't get terrified by it or so that it doesn't get out of hand. Cause I mean, manipulated. Right. I mean, we really do have new dangers that never existed before. We have nuclear weapons. Now we have the ability to engineer, um, you know, nasty viruses. We have, the, there's a growing number of dangers that scientific advancements are giving us, yes. which does mean that we have to have more people who understand what's going on and can help police things better and police this conversation. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know if you want to talk more about the genetic engineering, expand on that, but... Yeah, yeah, I mean, genetic engineering in particular, I mean, any time you... I mean, this... Uh, I mean, there are two realms. There's the agricultural realm and there's the medical yeah. realm. And so the agricultural realm, that ties into the whole uh, organic craze and sort of the pushback against having science in your food and uh, people not not really knowing what organic means and that actually in that in that realm it's essentially a buzzword that that kind of doesn't mean anything um yeah. but it, it's just it's a lesson in showing how people will um will align their behavior their their purchasing behavior with these uh, with these memes, with these, uh, with these, um, you know, linguistic trends, you know, everybody wants that, that word on the package to the point where, you know, you can find in the book, I, I talk about how I've seen products like non GMO salt. 
Yeah. <laughs> what in the hell does that mean? It's not an organism. It doesn't have genes. There's no thing. There's no G's to M. What? Why is this on here? But this is marketing, right? I mean, people yeah. want to see the friendly label with the leaf. That means no science in here. Um, yeah. And so, o- organic Wi-Fi. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's right. that's why the <laughs> that's why the book title is 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 perfect uh, for the book because it, it's just sort of that person who who. Uh, is is really really devoted to uh, aligning themselves with this buzzword organic, and yet really truly does not know what it means. Um, and right. I don't want to be malicious about it. I want to help people understand, uh, you know, what what go what what's behind all all of this. You know, what's driving this uh, commercial behavior. Um, but uh, so that's that's the agricultural realm. Then obviously there's the the medical realm. You know we've been doing mm-hmm. gene therapy for a while, and now you know CRISPR is something that most people have at least heard of. You know, right? Um, and and the application here in the medical realm is 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 unthinkable. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. It's revolutionary technology that we will yeah. continue to refine over the coming decades that could potentially cure all disease, right? I mean, if you want to talk about uh, curing cancer, you know, mm-hmm. all cancer has a genetic basis. If you have the power to uh, to to uh, edit the genome of any cell at will, you have the you have the uh, yeah. possibility of literally curing all cancer and then any other disease that that has a genetic basis. Um, so, I mean, it, it's it, not only that, I mean, the anti-aging uh, potential, yeah. right? I don't think people realize that aging is to an extent an arbitrary cellular mechanism. Um, and so uh, with with this un, with some kind of unlimited control over the genome and we really have. So uh, the, the, the reason we all need to understand this stuff is because the power is immense. And if the oh, entire yeah. conversation is only in the hands of ultra elite people, um, and they can use our ignorance against us to uh, to you you know prop up these propaganda campaigns, keep mm-hmm. everybody ignorant as to what the concepts are, to what they're doing. We we run the risk. Uh, you know, I hate to. I'm a very optimistic guy. I don't <laughs> yeah. like to think in like a yeah. dystopian way. But if you can if you pretend that it's inconceivable that we could in a, in a hundred or two hundred years have a situation where some ultra elites have manufactured their own immortality and they're lording over a peasantry, uh, a global peasantry. I mean, it's, it's within the realm of physical possibility and we don't want that to happen because that's the end of the human race as we know it. Um, so we need to understand, you know, I don't like to get so dramatic there, but, um, you know, we, we just, we got to understand the, just, that's the very first step is just, we need to understand basic genetics. That's all. Right, we need right. to understand what DNA right. is, what it does. I mean, the, the amount of people who don't know what transcription and translation are from DNA to protein, they, they truly don't have never, you know, maybe yeah. heard of it in ninth grade biology and then never thought about it ever again, really don't know what DNA is or what it does. It's just right. DNA. It's the, it's the genetic code. And, and why, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. Stop talking to me. You know, <laughs> just like, yeah, right. but uh, we need that basic understanding. That's the first step. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we need people from my, one of the things that I, I've been trying to argue about, you know, we talk about a lot about the importance of diversity. We, we do need people from all different walks of life that have access to what's happening in science. Like the biggest decisions being made for humanity are happening behind closed doors in the laboratories, I would say. You know, we, we spend a lot of time worried about politics. We should spend a lot of time worried about science too. Like what is happening? What are, what are different... Um, what are the new technologies that are coming up? How could they be used? What do we need to be worried about with how these might be used? And then the, there's also the fake worries. There's like with, with genetic engineering, for example, there's like this, uh, this worry that, um, you know, maybe my corn no longer has a soul or whatever <laughs> because it's got a, it's been genetically modified. There, there's, there's some really silly concerns that people have because they don't understand how the science works. And then there's legitimate concerns that you could have if you actually understood how the science works. Um, and and we need a lot of smart people or a lot of informed people from all walks of life thinking about this and raising concern if they have concerns. And yeah, being a part of this conversation, it, it, that just requires that you you learn how this stuff works. My uh, One of the things that saddened me about the creationist movement is that people who are really 
stuck in that. Like they never end up going into science. Like the science itself becomes a scary thing or a like a, a, a bad word. Is is it, it, that's my experience in dealing with a lot of people that are that are really into like the young Earth creationism, and and they they don't want to participate in this stuff because they have kind of been told that it's evil or that they shouldn't Satan, satanic yeah. yeah they're they're just pulling themselves out of this conversation which is unfortunate now we, yeah. we we're actually over an hour now and i don't i, I don't know uh, how you're doing on time i do have a, a final thing which we can do or not depending on how much time sure. you have yeah, here yeah. but that yeah. is i have this kind of new like pet peeve it's just you know issue that, that's driving me nuts a lot of the anti-science movement has now taken over uh, the the word pseudoscience. They're using that all the time to talk about things that are actual science. <laughs> They're calling them pseudoscience. And then <laughs> the phrase critical thinking is starting to be taken over by like the anti-vax movement. And I, I think that maybe uh, to try and preserve these words for what they're supposed to be used for, <clears throat> just talking about them um, sure, might be helpful. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, you use the word pseudoscience several times in your book. What does that word mean in your mind? Like, what do you mean by pseudoscience? So pseudoscience is, um, is something that masquerades as science. So it, it presents itself as science. And of course, in science, we use uh, theoretical constructs. So we build models that, uh, that correlate data and make falsifiable predictions. So that this is at the heart of science. So Pseudoscience is something that presents itself as doing that. Uh, so to me, the, the quintessential pseudoscience is astrology and always will be uh, because uh, it's mm -hmm. very old. It's been around a long time, um, but n the way it operates now, we can call this the, the ideal pseudoscience because it does present itself this way. It presents itself as correlating lots of data. So the positions of celestial objects, earthly events, personalities, people, right? It's all intertwined according yeah. to this model. Um, and it does make falsifiable, uh, falsifiable predictions. If a person is born on this day, they'll be kind of like that. If you're right. this sign, this is what's going to happen to you today. So it does make predictions. Uh, the problem is that they are uh, ex ex extremely vague. <laughs> and so yeah. they're not really uh, – uh, they're not quantifiable. That's a big problem. Uh, and then also it relies on confirmation bias uh, because the, the predictions are regularly falsified. They're almost exclusively falsified. Um, and when they're verified, it's just – it's chance. It's probability. Right. <laughs> because of how vague the predictions are. So um, that to me is the perfect pseudoscience. It, it masquerades as science, uh, although it doesn't even do that great a job at it because it just totally uh, opts out um, from the discussion of a physical mechanism, right? I like mm -hmm. to talk to every, you know, with when people who believe in astrology, um, there's two routes to go. There's what I just said, all of these predictions are wrong. So it's not yeah. true. But then there's also the half of like, what could possibly be this physical mechanism? You're, you're talking about physical phenomena. You're talking about stars that are physical objects. You're talking about humans that are physical objects. Mm -hmm. There must be some physical mechanism. You cannot just say magic and think that that's good enough. But, um, you know, most people just say, well, we're not smart enough to know and we'll never know. So that, you know, yeah. but um, again, that's not scientific. That's not a scientific approach to that. So that's uh, hopefully answering the question. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's great. So, so something that's pretending to be science, it, it's, it uses the public's trust in science because the public does have a fairly high level of confidence in science in spite of all the anti-science stuff that happens. Sure, yeah. And you exploit that. You can exploit that to promote an idea, promote a product, whatever, uh, by pretending. You just, all you got to do is put on a lab coat sometimes, and then talk about your right. Your yeah. Then whatever. there's that aspect: is people who just pretend to be scientists mm -hmm. and use big words, and then everyone will say, "Oh, well, he knows what he's talking about." That that's right. actually the other scary thing is that people know that um, you know. Uh, well, okay, where's the peer-reviewed science behind this, right? And so yeah. people have kind of figured out that because people, because the <laughs> average person has no hope of comprehending yeah. primary scientific literature, people have taken to generating these sort of pseudo publications yes. where they can flash something that looks like a scientific paper. And to somebody who thinks that they are thinking critically um, but, you know, has to admit that they don't have the background to comprehend something. They just go, okay, that looks like a paper. So what he's saying must be right. Uh, that's a big problem. It's yeah. a very big problem because, 
you know, we, we can't, we can't, it's a too big of an ask for the general public to be able to read primary scientific literature. It's, yeah. it's too dense. They're not going to be able to do it ever. So um, <laughs> that's a big problem. <laughs> yeah. So okay, I actually have a, a story about this. I had my, my hearing doctor growing up became friends of our family. So, you know, he, he's the guy who'd come test your hearing and stuff. And uh, really good dude. He got in a car wreck and he started taking a lot of medications and he was just in absolute pain like the last half of his life. And he kind of uh, went off the deep end. He started, he got into a multi-level marketing company that was selling this molecule or this, this vitamin that he says can cure aging and all this stuff. And he's trying to tell me, he's like, oh, you do stay clearly animations. You should do a video about this. And I'm like, I'm looking into it. Like, exposing it? Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to do a video about this. He's like, it's, it's real. Look, he, here's, the, here's the scientific papers. And he sent me, they were actual, it was an actual medical, or it was an actual journal. I looked into the journal. They, they published a lot of stuff. But the experiment was taking this vitamin and putting it in, in a Petri dish of cells. So, you know, uh, like HeLa cells or something. And it showed that it increased the HeLa cells metabolism. And I'm like, okay, you, you're showing me that this, that this vitamin increases a cell's metabolism. Well, this, this vitamin, this mixture, it has caffeine in it. That's one of the active ingredients. Of course it increased the cells metabolism. Like that's like, mm -hmm. that tells us nothing. This is cells in a Petri dish and they started acting hyperactive. How is that research that this cures aging? Yeah. <laughs> how does this trans? Yeah, and how does that transfer to uh, first of all to to an entire uh, physiological system? Yeah, a human right. a human body is much more complex. And, and I know that this company is like, okay, we're going to have this product. We need to get some papers about it. And if we just have mm -hmm. some papers about it, and we can put those papers on our website, we're done. They don't. We don't need it. to do yeah, anything. They don't yeah. read it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'm like, <laughs> so yeah, he it, it was, we had a. <laughs> Horrible conversation after that, <laughs> but yeah. it, unfortunately that kind of ruined our friendship there. But the, uh, the, the, the games that people play are, are insane. Now, one of the things that, uh, actually you said this in your book, you said that, um, that alchemy, you, you talked about alchemy as being pseudoscience and I definitely agree. Like modern styles of alchemy are pseudoscience, but there was a time when alchemy was, it would be proto science, right? I mean, it gave sure. rise to chemistry. Yeah, and I think the uh, quote was, "I said alchemy, or I said astro astrology is to astronomy as alchemy is to chemistry." Right, and actually, both of these both of these things were proto science, in that they were yes. like people were actually the culture of critical thinking that we have now and the scientific method that was starting to form in astrology and in alchemy. In the sense that astrologers were taking uh, uh, hyper detailed uh, uh, data, were recording uh, data regarding the positions of celestial objects to right. to the greatest precision that they could at the time. Right. So that is scientific data. They were collecting right. data. They just weren't doing anything good with it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So. And in, in, in alchemy, if you like the during the what is it the they call it the Islamic Golden Age. You had mm -hmm. all these alchemists that actually they became very strict in how experiments should work. Um, you know, like th they invented a lot of the distillation tools that we still use today. So yeah. there, there were really huge advancements in these fields at one time. Then that got taken over by the, the, the whole field got refined. In the case of chemistry, we now call it chemistry instead of alchemy, which basically it's it was continuing the good parts of alchemy and getting rid of the, uh, the woo woo, right? Yeah, the transmutation. And yeah. Yeah. And then you had the same thing. You have, you have a fairly similar thing with astrology and astronomy, right? Didn't it, it, I don't know enough of the history on astronomy to know where it came from, but did that actually, was that actually birthed out of astrology? Well, sure. You know? Yeah. Because I mean, astrologers, as I said, were, were, you know, the, the, the first thing that had to be done was here's all these stars. Here are these constellations. Here are mm -hmm. the planets. Here's everything, you know, here, here is, uh, here, here's the cyclical nature of you know, where they appear, uh, through the night over, you know, over the year, the, the, the yearly cycles, uh, and all of that. And, um, I mean, 
as to the point, the specific point where you would begin to call it astronomy, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly by the Copernican revolution, you're calling it astronomy. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think you still call Ptolemy astronomy. Um, uh, I think maybe you call it astronomy because he was uh, creating comprehensive models that yeah. had predictive, uh, yeah. pr uh, predictive power. So geocentrism uh, did okay for so long, or did, what was dominant for so long because it did okay. Right, it did right. okay at predicting the positions of celestial objects. It's just yeah. that then all of these uh, anomalies started cropping up where we had to make all of these ad hoc things like the epicycles. And it just, it became a mess where we were like, this just doesn't make any sense any longer. And then heliocentrism, boom, everything snapped back into place. Uh, and it's very simplistic. You know, you have your elliptical orbits. Everything's fine. We can now predict the positions of the objects with, you know, a thousandfold greater accuracy uh, yeah. or precision. So that that's that's how that came about. Um, I don't know the point where you would call one and then the other, but um, yeah, but yeah. yeah, it's very clearly a continuum of thought. And uh, but but you know, w with with more empirical thinking and and more success with the models. Yeah it becomes more rigorous, becomes more scientific. So. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. on, in some of my videos I've had, I've gone through and, and gone way back. So I, I was reading a lot of stuff by Jabra Ibn Hayyan. I mean, it's translations. It was original in, in Arabic. So this, this guy, he was an alchemist and he is, he's actually, people don't know if he was a person or a research group. Um, right. And so alchemy the, the, at the, the time. The volume of what he published is almost unthinkable for a right. single person. Right. Yeah. But but there's I was, and a lot of it was too dense for me, and a lot of it was it was a lot of it was very religious and very like mystical, and then you'd have little little veins of science. But I was actually talking to, because I do I do Arabic translations for my videos now, and I was talking mm -hmm. to what to one of the people who's helping me with, helping me with translations. He says that one of the things that the uh, when so you had Greek alchemy and then you had Islamic alchemy. And one of the big things that happened there was the uh, within the Muslim religion, it was blasphemous for a person to command the earth to do things or command the elements to do things because that was for the prophets to do. Mm -hmm. And so there was all these magic spells in uh, Greek alchemy. And one of the early experiments, and I have not confirmed this, but you know, this is just our, my chat with this guy. He said some of the early experiments were to, to see whether or not chanting a spell mattered. And they found that the timing mattered. So as you're mixing ingredients, the spell helped you keep track of timing for a reaction to happen. But that was it. So you oh, weren't. And, and, and he's like, he's like, I, I, he's like, just think about this. Think about, you know, I can't remember. I don't know. It's like a thousand years ago. You can you know that some people are better at commanding animals to do stuff than others. So you might there's a sheep herder and he says he whispers something and the sheep all obey. You can talk to the sheep; they don't do anything. It would make sense to you intuitively that some people can talk to animals, some people can't. Some people can talk to elements, and some people can't. And mm -hmm. so this idea of magic spells is natural to to think that it's real. And the uh, these alchemists were able to prove that it's not. And that was like a big breakthrough in science, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, so it, it's really neat to think about how things we take for granted now, like, of course, magic spells don't work. Someone had to figure mm -hmm. that out <laughs> and someone right, had right. to demonstrate that. And, that, and this was happening, you know, these, these early alchemists, they were very meticulous in, in keeping records of their experiments. A lot of their stuff was secret as well. It's kind of like uh, corporate sciences now, where you're you've got mm -hmm. patents and so on, because people wanted it. People were using chemistry and alchemy and stuff to, to maintain power. I've got. I'm the only one who can make this particular drink or this particular Elixir, explosion. Yeah. yeah, explosive. So, yeah, it's 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 so fascinating to look at this. But so there's yeah, there's definitely. proto science and pseudo science nowadays. If someone says they're an alchemist and they're trying to find the whatever stone. That's uh, now just pseudoscience. <laughs> that is that is pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. And then uh, critical thinking. Uh, what does that What does that mean to you? So I suppose critical thinking just means when you encounter information, um, not necessarily just accepting it at face value, trying to assess uh, the veracity of it, try to assess 
uh, try to examine who is offering the information, try to uh, conceive of what kind of motive they might have or what their background is, uh, checking up on, you know, uh, following up with the information that's been presented to you, uh, looking at other sources and comparing and uh, trying to put together to the best of your ability an informed uh, opinion of any information that's presented to you, uh, I suppose. Yeah. And it, it it can be hard. It can be hard to come to a solid conclusion a lot of times, but yeah, yeah the, you got to try though. <laughs> yeah, I it it really bothers me that because the um the video that I was sent about these um, vaccines spreading from one person to another, the title of it was "Learn How to Think Critically," and then they started spitting out all this garbage i'm like oh no yeah. <laughs> oh no <laughs> like, yeah uh, i mean it, it's it's really a mess it's really a mess because uh you know there's there, there's there's misinformation of all flavors there's misinformation right. that caters towards people who just want to hear the anti-establishment narrative and they'll gobble up everything you say then yeah. there's misinformation aimed at people who do who who fancy themselves critical thinkers and maybe even are critical thinkers, but then then it's a game of how can I package this information in in a way that that looks reliable. So right. this is what you were talking about before. I mean these sort of uh, these pseudo papers, to the point where uh, you you. Uh, if you can make your misinformation so dense that only an expert can debunk it, yeah. you've done very well because right. the general public is not experts. So then you've turned it into a game of the liar versus the expert. Who are you going to trust? And then let's figure out a way to discredit the expert. They're in the pocket of so-and-so, et cetera. So you've turned it into this really dense game. Um, which makes it much more difficult to deconstruct as opposed to something that is just visibly idiotic to someone even without any expertise in science. Yeah. Um, so that's, it's tough. It's, you know, there, there is a lot of stuff out there that I don't really fault people necessarily for falling for because yeah. it is so dense, but um, we got to yeah. try. Yeah. The, we have to push back on all that stuff. Yeah. People. So in the comments, there's been a conversation about, uh, being correct versus being good at debating. <laughs> um, yeah, like that. Yeah, this is a problem. Uh, you can have you can have really charismatic characters that just dominate in debates and are completely wrong, right? Um, yeah. A friend of mine, he he runs the YouTube channel Rationality Rules. He um he's got a really big following. He does a lot of critical thinking and uh, and and you know videos based on that, and. Uh, He's recently been doing a series about how his his own thinking has changed, and I've talked with him on this one on one. He said that he's he's like I I realize I used to think that I was right about almost everything because I would win all these arguments, and it turns out I'm actually just really dominant <laughs> and good at arguing. And so he's like he's like recently I've been going back and rethinking like. I've been I've been taking down videos and remaking ones and and apologizing for some misinformation. I, most of his stuff is awesome, by the way. But he he had a couple of things where he was he was arguing really strongly for something that was actually not not accurate. And so mm -hmm. it's it's been it's been interesting seeing like him realize that about himself. Like he could just dominate a discussion, and that that's was that's interesting. Yeah, and he doesn't even have any malicious intent. Now factor right. in malicious intent to deceive. Then then you have right. a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. So. So yeah, it's it's yeah it's tough I, out I there, folks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, if you asked me a couple years ago, I would have told you, yeah, debate. I'm gonna do all these debates and I'm gonna destroy these, you know, con men and debates. And uh, initially, I thought, okay, maybe that's a good strategy for me. And then I pretty quickly realized, wow, this is like, this is not as fruitful as I thought because you can uh, you can present uh, undeniable facts and you can present them very clearly. Um, and if the other person is, you know, is, is, a, is fraudulent or has, has this, has that malicious intent, they'll just deny it, spew the script. And then, you know, it, it, so I, I was a bit naive in thinking that winning a debate is about presenting, uh, an accurate, you know, presenting a good argument. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. so I've sort of, I mean, I wouldn't say that I've abandoned the concept of debate. I'm just very, uh. I, I, I fail to see the, the merit in it in most cases. Um, 
So, but I, I, you know, I wouldn't discourage everyone from, from doing debates because it is possible to, yeah, uh, to, to, to sway people. But, um, you really, when you have a certain combatant, uh, you really have to, I mean, it becomes not at all about, about facts. It just becomes about, uh, learning their script and countering their, their script. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, who it's just not, it's not that fun, you know? <laughs> it's not, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. You, you actually do have to know, you have to know all the tactics and all of the, um, yeah. it, it, it is an undertaking to, because I remember I did a yeah I did I did a video about uh, this mummy in Peru that everyone thinks is an alien uh, <laughs> because it's got an elongated skull and uh, I could not believe that I got more I I got more death wishes from that video from that one video than from all Jeez. of the evolution stuff I've done combined like there is a massive like enraged cult behind um, like these alien mummies that, that are in Peru. It was, it was amazing. Wow. Note to self, don't mess with the, with the alien stuff. <laughs> well, you can, you just have to know that there's a huge army of idiots yeah. that are there <laughs> waiting to, uh, I mean, I was basically just, it was basic anatomy. I was, I was, what they did on this mummy is they cut off the pinky finger and the thumb, and then they cut between the, the, um, the bones in the hand. So it made it look like it had super long fingers. And I just showed the skeleton in your hand versus this mummy and how it's obvious what's going on here mm-hmm. and uh people have flipped out like they they did not like you you weren't there to see it i'm like i that None there's x-rays there to see almost anything ever <laughs> there are x-rays in the video it's it, there's a it's guy it's a gaia video i don't know if you know if oh, you great yeah come no, in contact with that yeah is. what yeah. a what a hodgepodge of the dumbest stuff on <laughs> yeah. the internet yeah so it's uh yeah that was that was interesting, but mm-hmm. so my I, I ended up doing a follow up video with one of my friends who's actually like a full on believer in these alien mummies and so we we had a we had a much we had a, a nice friendly conversation we went back and forth on the evidence and it, it ended up being a good video and I found that that was that was a way that I could do this my for me if I get into debate mode the way that you do it mm-hmm. makes me like. I start getting angry at my dog and stuff. Like it, it takes over my, my life. I don't, it I don't does like a to little do bit. it. And I yeah. don't want to be that guy. Yeah. So uh, I stick to the debunks cause I can sort of like bottle it in one period of time and then yeah. let it go. So it's like, yeah. all right, I just eviscerated that person and now I can go return to my life. But, um, yeah. Someone was asking <laughs> if I was, if I would debate James tour and, uh, I've actually, I had been in conversation with him for, uh, for, it was just several years. I've, ago that we were in conversation about doing a presentation together to try and tease out where we agree and disagree. But the, uh, like, you know, the, the, the actual debate style gets, it, it's not, uh, it's not a thing for me. Like he's not interested in having a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, he told me that he, he, he didn't, he didn't want to do it. Um, no, so what I mean is he's not interested in having an honest conversation. Yeah. Yeah. He's got yeah. an agenda. That's what he's going to push. So, yeah. It's that that's that see that that's what's hilarious to me about a guy like him pushing for this kind of format uh, as as I've heard through the grapevine you know he didn't contact me directly of course but the word right. on the street is how badly he wants to talk to me uh, but um, it's just it's astounding to see a scientist devolve into a Kent Hovind like figure that is relying on this kind of a scenario for discourse it's like man you know. If you're going to present yourself as a scientist, you should do science, right? If you have critiques on abiogenesis, publish them, right? Right. That's right. what a scientist would do. Uh, and in fact, I challenged him to do that in my response. And of course, he did not acknowledge that. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's weird to see how quickly these, these evangelical types, I mean, this is the Discovery Institute uh, in credo, of course, but um, yeah. they, how quickly they devolve into, into this, these kind of tactics uh, it's like you, you could not advertise more strongly that you're not interested in science when you talk like this. Yeah, uh, and, and it's really unfortunate in the case of James because I, I think I talked about this with you that the um, like years ago, so when I first started on YouTube, it was like when I first started thinking about doing YouTube, I think it was like 2010 or so, and James was already on there doing science mm-hmm. outreach, getting kids excited about chemistry. I don't know mm-hmm. how effective it was. Like his videos, I, I tried looking at those 
recently they, don't, they still don't have very many views and they're they're really old so I, I don't know i don't know how well it worked but he was i mean if you if you look at his credentials he's done really good research in the past and he's actually really cared about legitimate science outreach he was really doing I, so i don't know what happened i don't know what clicked um so i mean you know he and i have tried i've tried to have conversations with about with him about this one on one but it's um yeah I, it's it's really unfortunate to see what's happened there. It's I just see it as like a like a good dude who's gone off the deep end, and I don't know how I don't know what I don't know what's going on. It's, it's well, it's it's unfortunate. It's not a mystery. It's not a mystery. Well, this is what religion well, does to an intelligent mind. Yeah, so. but it it is a mystery that it would go this hard so quick. I, I mean, it's just it's it's very unfortunate. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I don't, I think he has, uh, I, I think he's a narcissist. I think that he puts this information out and when he gets the pushback from rational people, he doubles down and, you know, no, yeah. I've got to push this point through. And, uh, I don't know, it's, it's really all blowing up in his face now. So it's just, uh, yeah, it's a yeah, we'll see. hilarious to watch his, uh, unraveling. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, uh, we're almost at two. We're almost at two hours. So let's. I, I think mm -hmm. it's probably time to wrap this up. I, this has been a great conversation. Yeah. The name of the book. Where where, where should they get the book? Uh, I mean, it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Bookshop, whatever. All the you know, all the main uh, websites. Is this Wi-Fi organic? Is is there is there a particular website that gives you more of a cut? Or is it the same everywhere? Uh, I don't know. I suppose I should know that. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Wherever yeah. wherever you buy books. Who cares? Yeah, yeah I, I see. I, I got the audio download because I already have a subscription to get a couple audiobooks a month. Right, right. So I don't know. I don't know how that kicks back money to you. And then yeah, yeah I get a they, chunk of that too. I, yeah. I, 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 to be honest, I don't. I, I'm a very bad businessman in this regard. Like I don't. I, I just got my like Q1 statement from them, and I'm like, yeah, it looks good. I don't know what. I, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I get some pre right. percentage. I forget what it is. Whatever. <laughs> That's cool. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, check out his book. If you get a chance, it's it really is, uh, yeah, it's it's great, great stuff. Highly recommend it. And thanks for coming on, Dave. This is great. Um, yeah, thanks for having really me. Really glad you're doing what you're doing. Your YouTube channel is awesome. Keep it up. Thank thanks. you very much.